I, I thought I'd start with a with a with a true story, and uh, it, it it goes like this. Uh, I had decided, for reasons of bad planning, that I would spend Saturday preparing this talk. At 6:30 on Saturday morning, uh, I got a call saying that my father had died in New Plymouth. So, uh, as befits me, I went to work. I wrote my speech and then flew to New Plymouth uh, to see my dad. He'd very kindly left me a note. Uh, he knew he was going, and he'd written to all members of the family. And his note said, "Jonathan, don't work so hard." Uh, <laughs> Well, I thought, to, I thought to myself, yes, but I wouldn't have written the speech if I hadn't been at work. So anyway, there we go. Um, <clears throat> Dad was 99 and uh, he wanted to go, so it was, it was sad to see him, but it was a great relief to the family as well. Well, uh, our constitution, as I've said, it hard, it's hardly a big draw card. It, it, it rarely sets our pulses racing or commands much of our attention. Unlike Team New Zealand, the All Blacks and the Silver Ferns, our constitution generates little passion or animated conversation. It does not have us glued to TV screens or workstations or iPads or iPods. Um, and it's certainly not the stuff of dreams or hopes, visions, games, films, plays or poetry, unless you're um, <coughs> Sir Geoffrey Palmer. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, I suspect that many people have very little idea uh, what a constitution is, let alone why it matters. But of course, uh, our constitution does matter. It's the heart of our democratic system. It sets the rules of the game by which we organize our collective affairs and our common endeavors. It provides the framework within which we endeavor to set our national priorities, resolve our differences, and make decisions on all important matters of public policy. If the framework is poorly designed or defective in some important respect, then obviously there are consequences and they will typically be bad. Well, in my view, New Zealand's constitution is not fundamentally flawed, nor is there a constitutional crisis on the immediate horizon. We are not about to hit a deficit ceiling, default on our public debt, or experience a government shop, a shut, shut down. We have a largely non-corrupt, effective, and reasonably <coughs> accountable governmental system. And for all these things, we can be very thankful. Against this, our constitution is far from perfect. There are, some, there are significant reasons for concern, and there is undoubtedly scope for improvement. In computing terms, it's time, in my view, to push the refresh button. So for such reasons, I commend the government in its decision several years ago to establish a constitutional advisory panel and to seek the public's views on a number of important constitutional issues. And in brief, for those of you who aren't following this closely, those issues that the Constitutional Advisory Panel is reviewing include the size of Parliament, the length of the term of Parliament and whether it should be fixed, the size and number of electorates, whether we should have legislation to, to support electoral integrity, that is to stop so-called walker jumping, whether we should alter our system of Māori representation, including the Māori electoral option, the Māori electoral uh, seat arrangements and other modes of participation by Māori in the political system, what role the Treaty of Waitangi should have in our constitutional arrangements, the content and status of our Bill of Rights, and finally the question of whether we should have a written constitution. Now the advisory panel, <clears throat> as many of you will be aware, has received thousands of submissions, and I suspect including from many people in this room, and it will be reporting to the government later this year. And, and I hope it produces a, a very full and thoughtful report, I'm sure it will, and I look forward to seeing that. But what are the grounds of concern that I mentioned earlier, and how might we improve our constitution? In terms of concerns, let me just note a number of things, which I think as citizens and as Democrats we should be concerned about. First, voter turnout in our general elections and local government elections has been falling for several decades. At the most recent general election in 2011, only 74% of citizens who were eligible actually voted, and that's the lowest turnout in general elections since 1887. The turnout in the recent local government elections was in many cases pitiful. A democracy, in my view, cannot flourish if its citizens do not participate in critical parts of the political process. So I think that is a real area for concern. Second, despite an electoral referendum on the future of MNP several years ago, 
2011. And despite a thorough review of important aspects of our electoral system by the Electoral Commission in 2012, and despite a series of well-considered recommended changes by that commission, the government announced earlier this year that the current system would remain completely intact. There will be no reforms, nothing. To be frank, I wasn't surprised. The same status quo outcome occurred in 2001 when a parliamentary select committee reviewed the MMP system. But given the evident problems with the current system and the enormous support uh, and effort that we need to um, uh, seeking to rethink aspects of that electoral system in various ways, um, it seems to me that our parliament has failed the public in not pursuing at least some modest changes. Indeed, many people would say it's made a mockery of the whole sort of review process. A third concern is the ease with which our important constitutional principles, values, and considerations can be completely overridden by Parliament. To give a few examples, in March 2010, the government introduced and passed legislation under urgency, which without public consultation sacked the members of the Canterbury Regional Council and appointed commissioners. The council elections due later that year were suspended. Subsequently, the 2013 elections for the Canterbury Regional Council were also suspended. It will thus be 2016 before local democracy is restored to that regional council. Perhaps the Fiji Prime Minister would approve of such action. But uh, as in Fiji, the grounds used to justify the government's decision to override the democratic process and suspend two elections were, at best, extremely thin. Next, consider the New Zealand Public Health and Disability <coughs> Amendment Act 2013, which allocates $23 million annually to people who care for disabled adult family members. This legislation was a response to a Court of Appeal decision which held that the government's policy of not paying family carers to provide support services for disabled family members constituted unjustifiable discrimination. Not only was this amendment act passed under urgency, thereby denying the opportunity for public input through select committee hearings, but official advice on the legislation from the Ministry of Health was heavily censored, with whole sections of the 28-page document blanked out, thus denying even parliamentarians access to the relevant information, even though they were responsible for enacting the legislation. I find this sort of thing quite extraordinary. And to compound matters, the legislation limits payments to carers to the minimum wage and dispenses with important constitutional safeguards. Under section 70E2, quote, no complaint based in whole or in part on a specified allegation that the policy unlawfully discriminates may be made to the Human Rights Commission and no proceedings on the same basis may be commenced or continued in any court or tribunal. This annuls the judiciary's primary function of declaring the meaning of legislation and its application in particular cases. It thus removes the judiciary's role in protecting individual citizens from unjustified governmental actions. And there are many other examples one could point to of abuses or potential abuses of our constitution and the democratic process, not just by this government, but by many governments. Let me just mention a few. Um, there's the recent failure of the Department of Conservation to provide a full and proper report on the possible impacts of the proposed um, dam in the Hawke's Bay, the um, Rua Tanifa dam proposal. Uh, earlier this year, amendments were made to the Crown Minerals Act under urgency again, which limit the right to legitimate protest in the case of deep sea mining in New Zealand's exclusive economic zone. And the amendments are said, at least by important constitutional experts like Sir Geoffrey Palmer, to be in breach of fundamental international human rights enshrined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We've had the repeated failure of the Minister of Education to follow proper legal processes in her efforts to close certain schools. We've had the failure in a number of cases of departments to provide free and frank advice uh, to ministers. We have constant changes to the purpose, functions and structures of local government. Um, four major changes in the purposes of local government in the last two decades. And, of course, not long ago we had sweeping powers granted to ministers and the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority under the Earth Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act. And I appreciate 
there are very particular circumstances there, but even so, uh, the extent of the powers granted are very considerable. And aside from all this, there's arguably a deeper problem, namely that our constitutional arrangements provide inadequate protection for the interests of future generations. In this regard, of course, New Zealand is not unique. All democracies are systematically biased in favour of the present, and elected governments tend to focus on short-term issues at the expense of the long term. And that's particularly worrying when we face large-scale irreversible changes, for example, like climate change. So turning quickly to some reforms. I'm not a revolutionary, as I'm sure most people in this room will be aware. I firmly believe in the virtues of measured, adaptive, evolutionary change. Such change should be principled and undertaken in an open, transparent and consultative manner with maximum opportunities for public participation. This is absolutely crucial, in my view, for legitimacy, durability and effectiveness. Well, with that in mind, let me just outline a few of the changes that I think we should consider very seriously, starting first with Parliament and our, our electoral system. Um, and I hope some of these suggestions will invite uh, comment <laughs> and perhaps controversy. First, I think we should increase the size of our Parliament, uh, at least to 150 MPs. As it stands, we have one of the smallest national parliaments in the developed world. We have no upper house, and we have very weak subnational government. In my view, the small size of our house enhances the relative power of the executive, limits the pool of talent for cabinet, and reduces the effectiveness of parliament scrutiny functions. Second, I think we should seriously consider giving prime ministers the opportunity to appoint a limited number of cabinet members from outside the parliament. This is normal in many other parliamentary democracies, uh, but it's not really legal in New Zealand since the abolition of the Legislative Council in 1949. Until then, a Prime Minister could appoint someone to the Legislative Council straight into Cabinet, just as happens in the UK when someone can be appointed to the House of Lords, go straight into Cabinet. We don't have that option here, and I think it would be desirable to have that option. Third, we should extend the term of Parliament to four years and move to a semi-fixed term, as for example in Sweden. Under this option, an early election could be called if there was a crisis of serious proportions, but the four yearly cycle would still continue. So there would still be the election that was due four years from the previous one, and that provides a major sort of political deterrent to calling an early election, uh, because people would then be faced with potentially another election in six months' time or something like that. Fourth, we should reduce the party threshold under MMP from 5% to 3 or 4% and eliminate the provision under which a party that wins at least one elected seat is eligible for additional seats as far as party vote, even if that's under the 5% quota. And fifth, we should lower the voting age to 16, as in countries like Austria, Argentina, Brazil and a growing number of other countries. Um, and we should couple that with a significant boost to the kind of civics education we provide to our senior secondary school children. The aim must be to connect young people to the democratic process at an early age, ideally while they're still at school. Next, it seems to me we should rethink the relationship between central and subnational government and try and build an enduring cross-party consensus on the role and powers of local government so that we don't constantly have this, chip, this, this chopping and changing in terms of the purposes uh, and, and responsibilities of local government. Given that New Zealand is already one of the most centralised democracies in the developed world, with about 90% of public expenditure going through the central government system, it seems to me uh, we should seriously consider a modest shift in the responsibilities of central government towards subnational government, for instance in areas like social housing and social services. Uh, but I realise there's very, very little support for such views across the policy community. Uh, if anything, we seem to just want to continue to centralise and, uh, wherever possible, take functions away from democratic control as well. I think that's unfortunate and risky. Finally, over the very long term, I would like to see New Zealand become a republic and embrace a written, entrenched constitution with a stronger Bill of Rights to protect fundamental rights and freedoms. This, of course, would represent a, a, a very, very significant constitutional change and would take decades, if not generations, to achieve more than the death of the current queen, in my view. In the meantime, however, 
there is a good case for considering ways to enhance the current status and role of the Bill of Rights Act. One option would be to follow the Canadian model. In Canada, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which was enacted in 18, sorry, 1982, gives the Canadian courts the ability to refuse to apply legislation that is inconsistent with the rights and freedoms contained in the Canadian Charter. At the same time, however, parliamentary sovereignty is preserved um, because uh, under the Charter, the federal parliament, or indeed a provincial legislature, can pass legislation which overrides the court's decisions on an interpretation of the Bill of Rights. So you have in the Canadian system, in other words, uh, a notwithstanding provision that the, that, the, um, that the Charter can be overridden, but it has to be done in a very, very e e explicit way. And thus far, certainly at the federal level, in the last 30 years, there has been no uh, uh, breach of the, explicit breach of the Charter uh, by the federal government in, in, in Canada. So the basic logic here is to try and enhance uh, the standing of our current Bill of Rights, not by making it fundamental law, uh, which we can't do unless we really have a written entrenched constitution, but by strengthening its overall role in the constitutional framework. And finally, uh, it seems to me we should also consider extending the rights encapsulated in the Bill of Rights Act um, including, in my view, uh, strengthening environmental rights and the interests of future generations. Currently, more than 100 national constitutions include within their provisions uh, the human right to a healthy environment. Such provisions are variously worded. Uh, for example, the Norwegian constitution um, provides under section 110b that every person has a right to an environment that is conducive to health and to natural surroundings whose productivity and diversity are preserved. Natural resources should be made use of on the basis of comprehensive long-term considerations, whereby this right will be safeguarded for future generations as well. And similar sorts of provisions are included in many, many other constitutions. The Brazilian constitution, for example, states that human beings, quote, have a right to a healthy, protected, and balanced environment. And there's now considerable court um, interpretation of some of the provisions in that and other constitutional arrangements. The basic point here I want to make is that <clears throat> we have uh, the capacity to do uh, very serious long-term, in some cases irreversible damage to our environment. We have, in my view, a duty to protect our environment for the well-being of future generations. There is currently not enough sort of constitutional protection, in my view, uh, for the environment and for future generations. And if we're going to be thinking seriously about constitutional reform, uh, then we should be giving uh, more emphasis to how we protect uh, the opportunities available to those who come after us in this long journey of human civilization. So in summary, we have a relatively long strong and positive democratic inheritance in this country. In constitutional terms, we have a great deal to be thankful for, but there's certainly no room for complacency and some valid reasons for concern. We need, in my view, to refresh and revitalize our constitutional arrangements and ensure that they continue to be fit for purpose. And that involves tackling a range of institutional arrangements, including refreshing our parliament and how it operates, uh, improving the working of our electoral system and strengthening the protections provided in the Bill of Rights to our fundamental rights and freedoms. Well, I, I personally think there should be an opportunity for referenda. I think we should have binding referenda when we are changing constitutional arrangements in a significant way. Um, uh, I'm not personally strongly inclined to regular use of referenda to decide sort of general policy matters, as for example happens in Switzerland. Uh, and, and, and that's not because I uh, fundamentally doubt the wisdom of the democratic <coughs> process, uh, but it seems to me that there is a very good case for representative democracy rather than direct democracy, and that we should only resort to direct, direct democracy in terms of binding referenda when we're dealing with the fundamental rules of the game. So that would be my... My, my, my basic view. And unfortunately, we're just 
about to have, aren't we, is, you know, another citizens initiated referendum, in this case on uh, asset sales, it, it will be uh, an absolute waste of time and money because the government clearly will take no, no um, notice of it. Uh, and I think that kind of thing undermines the credibility of, of that kind of um, uh, arrangement. So I don't think it, it, it actually helps or encourages uh, a sort of understanding of or, or, or support for the kind of institutions we have. Well, obviously the constitutional review in political terms was largely the product of a deal between the National Party and the Māori Party in forming uh, the government uh, some years ago. And uh, it's thus, I think, to be seen as a uh, you know, as one of the outcomes of a particular um, electoral result. Um, but I think it also highlights and reflects a, a, a genuine recognition, at least in some quarters, that there are important constitutional issues which require thoughtful attention. Uh, and so I'm one of those who thinks we ought to have that kind of thoughtful attention, and I'm pleased that we've got this review. What worries me is that I don't necessarily see the current government as having, or certainly the National Party, as, as having a strong interest in making any significant changes. And so the risk is that we will have a considerable amount of effort, as we are, in, in, in public engagement with the advisory panel. We'll have all the work that the advisory panel and relevant officials have done, and then potentially very little to show for it in a few years' time, other than yet another few uh, doorstoppers on the bookshelves. Um, I hope that won't be the outcome. I, I, I hope that it will be that the national the government will give the report of the advisory panel very serious consideration. But of course, uh, there will be another election in barely 12 months, and there may be a change of government, and so we might be in a very different situation in 14 months' time. Right away. Uh, thank you. Yes, it, it's, it's in my speech. I'm sorry, I ran out of time. Um, I, I, as I've indicated, so, and, and I think we should eventually have a formal, written, entrenched constitution. But I appreciate it, it will take a very long time to get there. When we have that, or soon, you know, if and when we have such a, a, a constitutional arrangement, I would embrace uh, the Treaty of Waikato. So the treaty was a fundamental part of the constitution, and it would thus have constitutional status. Um, I appreciate that raises all sorts of questions, including, of course, how the courts would interpret the, the nature and meaning of the treaty uh, in, in, in that kind of environment. But um, that would be my view. I, I mean, if we were to have a written constitution, we couldn't possibly not embrace the treaty, since it is our most important founding document as a nation. Um, with respect to Māori seats, if I could just say something about that, I've, I've, I've chopped and changed in my views on Māori seats. For the time being, my view is we should retain Māori seats uh, in Parliament. Um, but I would not be averse in generations to come if they, if they were to no longer be seen as needed. Um, but I think that's a very long time. Ah, well, I, I don't think a constitution is going to fundamentally alter the complexity of governing. Uh, it will alter uh, the way in which power is exercised, and it will alter the relative balance of power between uh, different parts of our constitutional order. In particular, obviously, if we had a written, formal written entrenched constitution with an entrenched bill of rights, then we would be enhancing, in broad terms, the, the role of the, the courts, and particularly the Supreme Court. Um, and that, that in itself, as many people in this audience would be very well aware, raises some very, very important, if not profound, questions, including around how we appoint our members of the Supreme Court. Um, but I don't think it would, it would fundamentally uh, alter the, the complexity of, of, of policy making. It, it would add another dimension uh, and a potential check uh, on, the, um, on the legislature. Um, uh, it wouldn't result in us having the kind of uh, 
complicated politics that we witness in the United States, because we would still have a parliamentary system of government. Uh, we would still have one parliament, and the government would be formed from within that parliament. So we wouldn't have the problem of having a, an executive in two houses, as you have in the US, with different factions holding power in, in, in different parts of the Constitution. So uh, a written Constitution wouldn't add that kind of c c c complexity. <coughs> Um, unless somebody proposed that we should you know, move to a presidential model, and I, I, I think that's highly unlikely. We, we have a strong and, I think, vibrant and largely successful parliamentary tradition and I see no logic in, in moving for a presidential model.